All right, you guys ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Amen. We're going to move really quick. Uh, we've got a lot, a lot, a lot of territory to cover today, so I'm going to be moving pretty quick. God, where are you? What an amazing statement. It's a statement that I'm sure you have possibly thought at some time in your life, or you have heard other people express. You may know people today that are wondering that very statement because of situations that have happened, things they have seen or heard about, or that have directly touched their lives. And people ask that question. And we as Christians need to be able to answer these, this question. We need to have accurate answers for ourselves as well as other people. Many of you today are going to go to parties and, and there may be someone there at that gathering that is wondering that very question. And who knows, God may be able to use you today to bring them some understanding and as a result, peace in their life. So over the next five weeks, we're going to offer you answers to this very tough question as well as some other tough questions such as, why me? God, are you listening? Do you care? Here's one. Who did this? And why did this happen? And the last one that I'll cover will be, what now? What now? So let's begin. I have been living with this question asked to me for over 40 years. Doing what I do, being a pastor, I get asked this a lot. I get brought into, along with the rest of our pastoral team, we get brought into those moments in life where things have happened that people wonder, where is God? Why did this happen? What do I do now? Where do I go? So this is a field, an area that I have studied for a long time. And when I decided to teach on this, I felt like the Lord instructed me to take you on the journey that I went on over the last 40 years to come to this place where I think I have some understanding. So we're going to kind of start with that. Does that sound all right to you? And I'm going to kind of take you into my brain, just a small area of it. I don't want to scare you and run you off, all right? And uh, so... Uh, here we go. The first thing that I came to understand when I began to ask this question or began to look at it or trying to find an answer for the question when I was asked it was I came to understand. I'm going to tell you something I know you know, but let's start at square one. Let's start at the basic. Hard times, tragedies, etc., are in fact nothing new. They have been with the human race since the Garden of Eden. If you have your Bible, turn with me today to Genesis, the third chapter, and let me show you what I'm talking about. When I began to look at this, right, God, where are you? Why did this happen? Where did this come from? How come this stuff goes on in the earth? God, why don't you do something about it, right? So we have to give answers, and we have to give more than, praise the Lord. I don't know. And there are answers to be given. Here in Genesis chapter 3, let's, let me show you something. This is vital to our understanding. All right? In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have just committed the sin of high treason. They have willfully and knowledgeably turned over the authority of the earth to God's enemy, Satan. They have turned their back. They have done the, very, the one thing God told them not to do. He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate it. With their eyes wide open, they purposely did it. God told them that in the day you eat of that, you will surely die. Now, they did not die physically that moment, but they died spiritually. Now, in addition to spiritual death, which I'll talk about maybe in another week, the thing that happened to them was is that sin entered into the earth. Now, not only the act of sin, but the power of sin. So in understanding about hard times, bad times, tragedies, we need to understand that it gets its root in the power of sin in the earth. Now, sin is not just like passive. Sin is aggressive. There is a power to sin. In fact, John warned us in 1 John that there is sin that if, you pra if practiced as a lifestyle, 
can kill you. It can take you out early. All of us know that. Can I hear a gunny men today? We have seen it, right? And I don't say that judgmentally. In fact, I say it, and it bothers me to say it. Do you know why? Because I know some men of God that should be in their pulpits today, but they're not in their pulpits today. Do you know why? Because there was an area of sin in their life that they practiced as a lifestyle, and it took them out. Good men, men that love their wives, love their kids, love their churches, love God. But they would not discipline themselves in an area of their life. They would not hold themselves, and it took them out. So we, we know there is a power to sin. Can I hear good amen today? And when sin came into the human race... We begin to see the first effect of it. Watch what he says, right? Hard times, tragedies. Watch what he says. He speaks, after they've sinned, he speaks to Adam, he speaks to Eve, he speaks to the serpent. And then he begins to reveal to them what's going to happen now, beginning in verse 16. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Sorrow, the word sorrow there means toil. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Right? So he says right there that in God's original plan, right, uh, getting pregnant, having babies, that was supposed to be easy. It was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to be a great experience. But now, because of sin coming into the earth, this experience now at times is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And not only that, it carries with it the idea of raising children. You and I know people right now, you may be one in here today, that there is sorrow in your life because of how your kids have turned out and what is going on with your kids or your grandkids. That was never God's will. All of that came because of sin coming into the earth. Then he says, and he says to the woman, and your desire shall be to your husband. The idea there is, is that the wife then will turn to her husband for comfort, and what's going to meet her is not comfort, but rule. In other words, he's going to seem superior to her. He's going to oppress her. You're not going to have this partnership. Oh, my gosh. Do we see that today? Do we see men oppressing women worldwide today? It was never God's will. Then he speaks to Adam, and he said to Adam, because you've hearkened to the voice of the Lord of, of your wife and have eaten of the trees I commanded you, you, you should not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In hard, back-breaking back labor shall you eat of it all the days of your life. There's a lot of us in this room today know that it's hard in the earth now, right? A lot of you are busting your backs to make a living. It was never intended to be that way. Life was supposed to have been a lot easier. But hard times came into the earth because of the power of sin. Are we learning anything? Amen. He said, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth you. You shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's not even fun to read, is it? I mean, it's just like, oh, it's like heavy but it all came because of the power of sin now watch this go with me to the fourth chapter and watch what happens and Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and, and bare Cain and said I've gotten a man from the Lord and then she, she she bare his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground verse 8 and Cain talked with Abel his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field oh my gosh that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and murdered him That's tragedy. A brother killing a brother? That's tragedy. Second generation human. We've already got tragedy. We've got hard times. We've got tragedy. So they began then. That whole area came through the power of sin entering into the earth. Is that clear to everybody today? All right? So it came to that. So it's, it's in the earth. It's here. All right? Now, before I go any further today, I think there's something I, I, I should share with you, right? I told you I was going to take you in to some of my understanding of this, right? And uh, so there's an area here that, I, I, that has helped me a lot 
in my reasoning and coming up with some things and trying to, you know, asking God for wisdom so I can answer this question, God, where are you? Why? How come? Who did this? What's it about? What do I do? How do I respond? I came to this, this understanding. Listen carefully. I think this will help you, right? That there are, in fact, four sources of life and death in the earth. There's four sources or four entities, if you would, that produce life and death in the earth. Number one, God. All right, God is proactive in the earth. Can I hear a good amen to that? He's not standing on the sideline watching. He is engaged. He is proactive, right? Many of us in this room, if not all of us, can say, I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen God do this. I've seen God do that. I've seen the fingerprints of God on my life. Can I hear a good amen today? We, all of us have experienced some, some level of that, right? Even before we knew the Lord, right? There's probably been times we've said, wow, thank you, God. I didn't deserve that. Why? Because he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Okay? And, uh, you know, I, I had an incident when I was in high school where really and truly I could have died. I'm, I'm not over-exaggerating. I could have easily, easily been killed. Very easily. I was right on the edge, and all it would have taken is just a, literally, literally. I mean, I think about it at times, and even now when I think about it, I, I get like, I, I start, I just, at times I even start shaking because I realize how close I came, right? And somehow I didn't, it, my, my car did not go that way, and I got home safely. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing reality. All right? Was I serving God then? If I was serving God then, I would not have been in that position. No. But God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And that night, I happened to be where the rain was falling. <laughs> so God, God is active in the earth, right? Number two, Satan. There is a real devil, and he is engaged. The Bible tells us in Colossians, there is a kingdom of darkness. And he is engaged in the earth. He's real and he's here. Now, he wants to give you the idea that his kingdom and God's kingdom are neck and neck. They're not. They're not. The difference between the power of God's kingdom and the power of the kingdom of darkness is what the NFL plays and what your kids play on the weekend. <laughs> All right? There's no comparison. Amen? All right? So that's cool. All right? Number three. This one may surprise you. Number three, so there's God is, is the source of, of life and death. Satan is the source of life and death. Okay, we're just lumping it all together. And number three, humans. Humans. People do stuff. People do stuff. They just do it. There's a lot of stuff that God gets blamed for and the devil gets blamed for. It wasn't God and it wasn't the devil. It's just people. Amen. Come on, you can say amen to that. It's just people. We are not automatrons. We are not puppets on a string. God is not yanking our little strings and we go out and do things and people do good and people do evil because God yanks the chain or the devil yanks the chain. No, 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 no. We are free moral agents. We can do what we want. We can act like we want. We can be who we want. We make our own choices. You can choose life. You can choose death. You can be nice or you can be a jerk. The choice is up to you. Amen. All right, so a lot of stuff that God gets blamed for, God had nothing to do with it. A lot of stuff the devil gets blamed for, I'm sure he's like, what? I didn't do that, but I'll take credit for it, right? <laughs> it's just people. It's just people. People do it. And number four, this one may surprise you even more. I think that a lot of what goes on in the earth isn't God, isn't the devil, isn't people. It's just life. It's just life. We, do, we live in an imperfect world. It's imperfect. It's imperfect. I would love to blame every hurricane and typhoon and earthquake and tornado on the devil. I don't think so. I think it's just life on earth. I think it's just life. I do. 
I think there's just stuff that goes on. It's just life. And not all of it's bad. Some of it's pretty cool. You know? But I think it's just life. Life on earth. And I think if you'll embrace that thinking and meditate upon it for a while and just think about it, I think it'll start making sense to you. And it'll also help you to answer some of those questions. You know, because really I think a lot of times when we ask, God, where are you? What we're saying is, why did you do this or why didn't you do something about it? Well, the first thing we've got to always understand is that we are free moral agents. And a lot of stuff that happens in the earth, God was against it. For instance, when I finish teaching here today, if I wanted to, I could go up here to the gas station and rob it. All the way up there, God's going to tell me, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Oh, you did it. And guess what? God's going to love me all the time I'm in Huntsville. For those of you watching online, Huntsville is our state prison, all right? So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in Huntsville. And guess what? He's going to love me the whole time I'm there, and he's going to love me when I get out. But he's not going to come down and stop me. If he was going to stop humans, wouldn't he have stopped Adam and Eve? Now, we can get into huge theological debate over all that and say, well, blah, blah, but it doesn't matter what I think or you think. The, the, the reality is he does not stop you from doing what you want to do. He directs you. He guides you. He leads you. He instructs you. He calls his light to shine upon your path. He puts up roadblocks, but you can jump those roadblocks. You can go home today and almost said it, your whole family. You can get everybody in a war or you can go home today and be nice. Amen. God's telling you to be nice. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen? Now, the sad thing is, is that oftentimes God gets the blame for things that he had nothing to do with. What does God do in the earth? Psalm 119 verse 68 said, thou art good and doest good. Thou art good and doest good. God is in the earth doing good. God's not killing anybody. God's not punishing anybody. God's not whacking anybody. All right? God is good and does good. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God said, I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. He's clear what he wants you to pick. He's clear what he wants you to have. He wants you to have life, and not just life, abundant life, John 10, 10. So he wants us to have life. He tells us to choose life. Choose life. Make decisions that give you life. What is Satan that proactive in the earth? The thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, John 10, 10. Jesus made it clear. Satan's about stealing, killing, and destroying. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 16, God calls him the waster that destroys. He's the waster that destroys. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, we are instructed to put on the whole armor of God that we may stand against the wiles of the devil and to take the shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So the devil has a plan for your life. God has a plan, the devil has a plan. And he said to stand against the plan of the devil and put up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts. So he shoots fiery darts at us out of the kingdom of darkness. So we see then and let me be clear if you don't know this. The kingdoms don't mix. God doesn't use the devil and the devil doesn't help God. They are sworn enemies. All right? So, is there anything there that help you think about some things, maybe a little bigger picture? Okay, now let's look at this. Oftentimes, I said, God is blamed for things the devil did, the earth did, and mankind did. Several years ago, I was involved, I got involved in this personal study on the subject of humility. And the reason why I was studying it, because I read in, in James where James said that God resists the proud and gives grace and embraces the humble. Amen. Well, you know, my lightning fast mind told me that, okay, I can live one of two ways. I can either have God embrace me and grace me or resist me. 
I've got enough resistance without God being against me. I'm going to do what I need to do to get him to embrace and grace. How many of you like that little thought, right? So I started studying humility, all right? And I discovered that in the Bible, it is the hardest word to define in Hebrew and in Greek. It's the hardest word to define. And so uh, as I was looking at it, the best example you get on humility is to look at the men who were known for humility, Moses and Jesus, okay? And so anyway, I was looking at it, and I found a definition, listen to this, of the word humility. It actually shocked me, but it helped me to understand this area also. That in the Greek text, the word humil- humble means you do not blame God for the evil that men do. You do not blame God for the evil that men do. So when we are looking at, God, where are you? Why did this happen? Where did this come from? What's the result of this? One one question we need to make sure when we're asking that question is, is this the evil that men did? Is this the evil that men did? And if we're, if we're not careful and we blame God for the evil that men did, then in fact, listen to me, please. You will not see what God did in the midst of the evil that the men did. Amen. I'm going to tell you a story. I haven't talked about this in 15 years. I talked about it one weekend. I've never talked about it again. But in, in 9-11, everybody remembers 9-11, 9-11-01. 9-29-01, 9-29-01, days later, I was in, on the East Coast speaking in a church, actually in Pennsylvania, and a man came to the meeting, and this was a right time, right place moment for me, right? I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I met this guy. He came to the meeting. And, and afterwards, the pastor introduced me to him, and he, he worked as a chaplain in New York City for the uh, fire department. He was a chaplain. And so I was talking to him, and I said, Are you, have you had anything to do with the fire department, the survivors of 9-11? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I go to the site, to Ground Zero, every day. And I just said, oh, my God, you know, I I was just taken back. And he looked at me and he said, do you want to go? I said, you can get me. He said, I can take you and you can come with me. Because by then it was closed. It was a closed site. You couldn't go anymore. It was closed. He said, but you can go in with me. I said, absolutely. So the next day I got a ride to New York City and he met us and and, uh, he took me on. And I spent three hours on ground zero. And it changed my life. I, I, will, I went there one man and I came out another man. It changed my life. I'll never be the same. And I had a, it, was a, it was an incredibly emotional day, as you can imagine. And I was standing there, and, and just to give you the whole picture, it was still smoldering. You could smell uh, the stuff burning still. You could smell, I'm not trying to be gross, but you need to know, you could smell the rotting flesh. Uh, and I was standing there watching. Some of you remember the pictures of the firemen in, a, in a, like a line going up a mound, and they were passing buckets down. Remember that, those pictures? Huh? That's kind of engraved, engraved in us, isn't it? And they were passing those buckets down, those big red buckets they had, and they were passing them down. And the reason why they did that, as many of you know, is because they were human remains, and they sorted through the buckets one at a time because they wanted to treat any human remains with the utmost respect. And so I was standing there watching that and seeing all this stuff. Well, anyway, there was a man standing next to me. I'll speed up the story now. There was a man standing next to me, and he looked at me. I was very emotional, as all of us were back then. And, uh, and so I was uh, standing there, and he looked at me, and he said, so who are you? He was a very kind of authority-looking guy. And I said, well, I'm Charles Neiman, and I shook hands with him. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I, I came with that chaplain over there. And he said, he said, that chaplain brought you? And he said, yeah. And he said, why would he bring you? I said, well, because I'm a pastor. And he went, oh, well, welcome, pastor. Great to have you on the site. He said, please feel free to pray for anybody here. 
you can walk up to any of these men and say, can I pray for you? He said, they'll say, yes, please do. You'll, 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 you'll have no resistance to prayer here on the site. And I prayed with a lot of guys that day. But anyway, I looked at him and I said, and, and what are you doing here? And he said, I'm an engineer. He said, I come here every day. He said, I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm working with another team of engineers and we're figuring out how to get all of this cleared out so we can rebuild immediately. I love that. He said, because we're going to rebuild this. It's not going to stay this way. Amen. And I said, well, that's fantastic. And he said, yeah, I'll come every day. And then he looked at me. Listen, there's a pur purpose to this story, and here it comes. He looked at me, and he said to me, he said, you know, Pastor, I get asked this question, and he said, and I bet you do too. He said, I get asked all the time, hey, where was God on 9-11? And he said, let me tell you where God was from an engineering standpoint. He said, as an engineer, he said, none of us can figure out. He said, we've spent hours. We cannot tell you why the towers didn't fall to the side. He said, it makes no sense that they collapsed. He said, engineering-wise, they should not have done that. Once they were hit, he said, they were crippled and they should have collapsed to the side. He said, you know what would have happened if they had collapsed to the side? I said, no. He said, come here. He walked me over and he showed me. Unless you've been to New York City, you don't really understand how close the buildings are. We don't build like that out, out west. But in New York City, they build right next to each other. There are times, I'm sure if you're an NBA player, you could stand and touch buildings like this in New York City because they build right next to each other. If those towers had fallen to the side, the city of Manhattan would have began to fall like dominoes. It would have just been to collapse, building after building after building after building after building after building. He said it would have gone on for just until it ran out of buildings or ran into the ocean. He said they would have just collapsed and the whole city would have been decimated. He said if they had flown those planes there four hours later than they did, he said there would have been 100,000 people in the buildings and in the plaza. And he said instead of having 3,000 dead, he said we'd have had 35 to 40,000 dead. Uh, and, and the same thing. He said, he said to me, he said, we can also not understand engineering why it took the building so long to burn. He said they should have burned much faster. He said it was like as if something slowed down the burn. And he said it was like, and he said, and that enabled more men and women to get out of the towers and more people to get off the plaza so more, people's were lot, lot, more people lived. He said, listen, he, he wasn't done. He said, if one of those planes had just clipped the building and landed in the street, he said, what a lot of people don't know is that underneath that street are the main huge big oil lines that flow from the, from, from the refineries into the city. There's also gasoline lines that feed all of the gas stations and natural gas lines that provide natural gas to all of the buildings in Manhattan. He said all of those lines run right down the middle of the street. He said also the street was loaded with parked cars, all of them with gas tanks, all of them with gas in the gas tanks. He said if one of those planes had clipped the building and nosedived into that street, it would have set those natural gas lines off. He said the entire city would have blown up. Because the gas lines, the fire would have spread all the way down the gas lines and they'd have, it had just kept erupting and those cars would have been turned into car bombs and those cars would have been to ex exploded. And he said, the fact is, Charles, he said, he said, Pastor, if any of those things I've just described to you happened, we would have had a minimum death toll of a quarter of a million people. And the city of Manhattan would have been destroyed and would never have come back as we know it. He said, so when people say to you, where was God? He said, you tell them he was everywhere that day. One more story, then I got to move along. Then he said, you see that building over there? And I'd noticed it when I came on the site. There was a building over here. Actually, it was to my right. There was a building over here. And I noticed a lot of the men kept going in and other men would come out. And they'd go in there for a little while and then they'd come out. What I thought it was was like a place where they could rest and kind of get control of themselves emotionally and then come back. And he, and he said, you know what that building is? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, no, we don't talk about this. We don't advertise it. He said, that's a chapel. He said, we had to open a chapel 
And he looked right at me. He said, Pastor, do you believe in people being born again? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, then you need to know that literally revival has broken out on this site. And he said, literally, hundreds of men are getting born again every day because God is touching them and ministering to them and helping them. Now, let us be clear today. God did not cause that tragedy to happen so those men could get born again. But here's what I'm wanting to point out to you today. We're going to look at scripture that will show, show this to you. That in the middle of a tragedy, in the middle of a hard time, right, what we need to train ourselves is to not focus on the tragedy, but to look for God standing in the middle of it to bring you out of it, to heal you, and to deliver you, and to get you through it. That's what I'm trying to focus to you today, that God did not do 9-11, but God has been there ever since 9-11. All right? And don't listen to some goofed up preacher. You know, because after 9-11, there were guys that came on TV uh, and they said, you know, this was God's judgment. Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Well, somebody go slap them. <laughs> I volunteer. <laughs> hmm? I remember when Katrina hit New Orleans. And so I, I can tell you the preacher's name, but it doesn't matter. All right? But he went on television that night and he said, this was God's judgment on New Orleans because they were going to have a gay rights parade in Bourbon Street and God brought Katrina. You goofed up guy. The fact is, if you go look at it, Katrina did nothing to Bourbon Street. Bourbon Street never shut down. It continued to operate all through the only thing. It was the only part of New Orleans that was not hit, and they still had the parade. Poor God. He aimed at Bourbon Street and missed. <laughs> well, it's like Jared said between services we were talking about, and Jared said, well, you know, God's GPS wasn't working. He just <laughs> GPS. I said, well, the truth is, you know, he's old. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. God had nothing to do with Katrina. He had nothing to do with earthquakes. He has nothing to do with any of that. Stop it. But God is there to heal, to strengthen, to help. Let me show it to you. Are you glad you came today? Uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I've got 10 minutes, and I've got 30 minutes of teaching. Scared you, huh? <laughs> Is he going to keep us there? No, I can't because there's three or four more thousand people lining up coming in, all right? But I want you to see something. I want you to see something about the Apostle Paul's life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, go with me to verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. So he gives you kind of an overview, and then he breaks it down for you, shows you what he's talking about. Of the Jews, five times received I 39 stripes. Five times. Did you see the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Remember the part when they were whipping him? Right? The part nobody wants to watch ever again? Paul went through that five times. Five times. I cannot imagine what that man's body looked like. Five times. Watch what else he said. Three times I was beaten with rods. Beaten with rods. Sticks, right? You take a stick and beat a guy. Once I was stoned. Not that stoned. <laughs> the one with rocks. Paul did not have the munchies out on the mission trail. <laughs> How do you all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm a child of the 60s. I understand it. I'm going way back. Old school. Thank you. All right. So long as I'm not first school. First school taught old school. Okay, here we go. Once I was stoned, three times I suffered sick rep. A night and a day I've been in the deep. I would have died right there. I'd have gone to heaven. Because the whole time I was in the ocean, all I'd have heard was dun 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 And as soon as something touched my leg, boop. Hello, Jesus. 
and journeyings often in dangers of water, dangers in the robbers, dangers of my own countrymen, dangers of heathen, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, dangers among false brethren, and weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hungers and thirsts and fastings often and cold and nakedness. Besides all those things that are on the outside, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Look at verse 29. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended? And he said, yet I burn not. He said, I have every reason to be offended. I read this list and I'm like, seriously? This is the Apostle Paul. This was a good man. Come on, give me a good amen on that. This was... This was, you know, there's a saying in leadership that there's, there's people that are born that are once in a thousand year people. They're saying that about Nelson Mandela now, that he was once in a thousand year person. Amen. Apostle Paul was once in a thousand year person. He's just that incredible. All right? Turn the page. Let me show you something that I pray will really help you today. All right? Paul goes on. He's talking about all this, and he's bringing it all out, all these things that happened to him. And so let's jump down uh, in verse 7, and, and we'll pick up. And least I should be exalted. He talks about going to heaven, about having visions and revelations in verse 1. He went to heaven, right, and, and met with Jesus, and Jesus taught him personally. And he said, At least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. It was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. Now, a lot of people say that God gave him that thorn to keep him humble because he'd given him so much understanding. I submit to you that that's nuts. All right, if God, if God is God and God knows everything, would God not know that if he gave him the revelation that it would puff him up? Well, then if God is a loving father, would he not then avoid the things that would destroy him and just keep the revelation from him and give it to somebody else? You know, when I was 16 years old, I got really cross with my dad because he wouldn't buy me a Corvette. <laughs> now I'm serious. I got bent out of shape for a long time. In fact, I don't think we'll quite over it yet. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, I, got, I got really bent out of shape, right? And I went to him and I was convinced that, he, that I could have a Corvette. I, needed, I didn't want one. I needed one. I needed a Corvette. And my dad said, no, I'm not going to get you a Corvette. And I said, why? He said, because I love you too much. I thought, oh, that's dad logic. That's just that dad logic. He said, son, I don't want to unwrap you off a telephone pole. You can't handle a Corvette. So I submit to you that if my dad, and you know what, he was right. If my dad knew that that Corvette would kill me, would not God know that if he gave Paul the visions and revelations, it would pump, pump him up so he would just keep them from it? Amen. God didn't give now, people have said that thorn in the flesh. I've heard it said. I, you may have even heard it preached that he had bad knees and he could hardly walk. And yet he walked over the known world three times in his ministry. He could hardly walk, but he walked over the known world three times. The other one they say was is that when he would preach, he had this condition. They even have a medical name for it where he had this infection in his eyes. And when he would preach, pus would run out of his eyes. <laughs> and yet people would sit and listen to him all night long. Now, all of you in here right now love to hear me speak and love to hear me talk, and you're here today. You're supposed to say amen right there, but I can't wait for you. And so, uh, but I doubt if any of you would come every week if I stood up here for 40 minutes with pus running out of my eyes. Now, a few of you are going to go, oh, I would, Pastor. Thank you for saying that, liar, liar, pants on fire. Amen. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you believe that. Amen. Listen, I love Jensen Franklin. I love my friend Joseph Prince. I love listening to Brian Houston. I ain't going to listen to any of them with pus running out of their eyes. I'm sorry. Not happening. I think the guy that it happened to can tell you what it was. He goes on. There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the angel of Satan to buffet me. The angel of Satan to buffet me. So Satan resisted him. Now jump with me down. Verse 8. This thing I thought the Lord tried said it might depart from me. And he said unto me, watch, my grace is sufficient for you. Say it with me. His grace is sufficient for me. I'm going to give you a bunch of definitions. In the next five minutes, write them down. I'm going to wrap it up. Here comes your hot fudge on your ice cream, right? All right? So, so, the, so the messenger was the angel of Satan, not of God. 
All right? He said, my grace is sufficient. The word sufficient means my grace will make you strong and able to resist. Did you get that? My grace, my favor, and my endowment of power. That's what grace means. My favor and my endowment of power will make you strong and able to resist. Okay? And then he goes into this list. And he makes this statement. God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So God is saying, where there is weakness, my strength will come. Where there is weakness, my strength will come. My strength is made manifest, is perfect when it is replacing weakness. Okay? So now, here we go. Right? He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now he breaks it down. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. The word infirmities, there, there are definitions that you read that stick with you. And here's one of them that sticks with me. The word infirmity says, when you have it, bad. When you have it, bad. Hmm? Isn't that a great definition? When you have it, bad. You know, I, look, I say it like this. When you're going through the have it, bads. Right? Life is good. Things are good. And then you have a habit bad. (laughs) Does anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Right? You have it bad. I'm having a bad hair day or whatever it is. Right? (laughs) That's your kid. You know, that that day. Hmm? You go to work and it's like, God, it's hard to fly with eagles when you work with turkeys. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) You know, it's just a habit bad. All right? He said, I will rather glory in my habit bad that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see what he's doing? He gave you a list in chapter 11 of all kinds of habit bads. And he said, but instead of focusing on the shipwreck and the rods and the rocks and the stones and all that stuff, he said, I focus on the power of Christ. Say, where is God? God is there in the form of his grace. God is there in the form of his strength so that you can resist. He continues. Watch what he says. He said, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. The word reproaches means when you're treated shamefully. When you're treated shamefully. There are some of you in life, and I'm sorry that you have been treated shamefully. What happened to you was shameful. It was shameful behavior. It shouldn't have happened. It's wrong. It should have never taken place in your life. Some of you right now are being treated shamefully. You're being treated shamefully. And you're too nice to say it, so I'll say it for you. Those guys were big jerks. They shouldn't have done it. But God has brought you to church today so you can read out of this chapter so he can say to you, quit looking at that, quit looking at them, quit looking at how you were treated, and look at my grace. Because grace is going to bring you out. Isn't this awesome? I'm telling you, I'm getting goosebumps. I really am. I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities. The, diction, the, the Bible dictionary defines necessities as opposing forces. Some of you right now are being opposed. There's forces working against you. There's some of you that you don't even want to go to work because there's people there trying to get you fired. There's forces trying to keep your company down. There's forces trying to oppress. There's forces at work in your marriage. And God is saying to you today, quit looking at that and say his grace is sufficient for me. His grace is going to make me strong and able to resist. Where is God? He's there in the midst of his grace. Let's continue. In persecutions, persecutions means when the when, 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 when situation tries to put you to flight, tries to get you to run off. You just want to run off. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, one night after, you know, everything happened with Rochelle, I was driving home one night. I was driving, you know, I live on the west side, I was driving home, and a thought came into my mind. It was so powerful. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The thought was so powerful. Why don't you just keep driving, Charles? Just keep driving, man. Just keep driving. Just keep going. Just go. Just 
keep going. Man, it seemed like such a great idea. And then I thought, but you know what the problem with that is? Is that when I stop, I'm still going to be there. Did you hear that? See, you can run off, but when you stop, the problem is you're still going to be there. With all the fears and the worries and the hurt and the anxiety and the anger and the resentment. So I said, well, since I'm still going to be there, let's just go home. <laughs> Might as well go to the house. <laughs> At least it's comfortable there. And I've got 500 channels on satellite. Amen. So, you know, why not go home? But God said, look, when you get that feeling that life is trying to put you to flight, are you catching this today? God, where are you? God is standing there. I'm right here in the form of grace. I'm right here in the form of strength. I'm right here in the form of power. I'm right here. I didn't go anywhere, right? The Bible said he is a very present help in time of trouble. When trouble comes to your front door, God doesn't go out the back door. He's not a good time God, bandwagon God. In distresses, the word distresses means, listen to this, anguish or discomfort, listen, from within. Paul said, when I'm anxious, when I'm having a panic attack, when I'm depressed, I look to God's grace. His grace is sufficient for me. Watch, we're almost done. You got to get this last definition. Listen to this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's strength, when God sees weakness, strength comes. Did you get that picture? When God sees weakness, God, I'm so weak, then, then quit looking at weak and start looking for strength because it's coming. Strength is coming. The strength is there. Strength is coming. Watch this. Watch this. You got to get this. In the Greek text, which the New Testament is written in, this is my, one of my all-time favorite definitions. I use it all the time in my life. Paul said, for when I am weak, then I declare, I am strong, I am able, and I can. I am strong, I am able, and I can. I am strong, I am able, and I can. Say it with me. I am strong, I am able, and I can. Right? I'm being treated, treated shamefully. Doesn't matter. I am strong, I am able, and I can. Right? I, I, I've been lied on. That's all right. I'm, being strong, I'm strong, I'm able, and I can. Right? I got pressure coming at me to put me to flight. Nope. I'm strong, I'm able, and I can. Can I get an amen on all that today? Right? I am strong. I am able and I can. Where is God? God is there in the form of his grace to get you through it and to be on top of it, praise God, to where you can look back and say, that's where the devil intended, but this is where God took me. Can we give the Lord the best hand clap we're going to give him all day today?